Hi, everyone. Welcome to the end-to-end -end mobile and IoT development in the Verizon Cloud webinar. My name is Jill Harani, and I'm on the Dream Factory team in California. I just wanted to take a couple minutes of your time before we start. I have everyone on mute today to avoid background noise. We will have a Q&A session at the end of the presentation, though. So if you have any questions, please enter them into the question box in the GoToWebinar control panel, and we'll answer as many questions as we can today. If, you do not, if we do not get to your questions before the webinar ends, we'll get back to you with answers to your questions along with the link to the recording of this session. For your reference, we've attached a copy of today's presentation in the handout section for you to download at any time during the presentation. The presentation deck provides you with valuable links that you might want to check out later. Now, without further delay, I'd like to first introduce you to Stephen Ruscha, Verizon Partner Solutions Senior Sales Manager. Stephen? Thank you, Jill. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar on promoting the use of Dream Factory's RESTful backend platform on Verizon Cloud's infrastructure. Let me share my screen before I get going here. Thank you for bearing with me one second. My name is Stephen Roche, as Jill said, and I'm pleased to serve as today's session chair. Can you see my screen, Jill? Yes. Okay, great. Let me just make sure I've got the right deck up for you, and off we'll go. All right, very good. Thank you. Uh, again, uh, my name is Stephen Roche, and I'm pleased to serve as today's session chair. I'm also the manager of the cloud team here at Verizon Partner Solutions, and I'm excited to be joined by Eric Lubin and Jan LeBlanc from Dream Factory. Verizon and Dream Factory have teamed to build a cloud-first platform for developers to create web, mobile, and IoT enterprise applications via a new portal that we just launched last month. Our unified Verizon Cloud portfolio delivers a range of cloud products supported by a collection of capabilities. For example, the development operation lifecycle from development to test to production, each phase requires a certain capability that can be configured in a project-specific cloud space configuration. Likewise, each project can leverage onboarding and migration services to accelerate adoption, as well as stratified tiers of managed services depending on how much or how little responsibility you want to assume. Rather than use an inexpensive public cloud alternative for development and test, starting on Verizon Cloud puts organizations at a much better starting point. It does this by allowing you to test on a production-grade cloud infrastructure, scale your support level with application and business requirements, build applications through the cloud marketplace and API settings, and easily promote applications from dev test to production. Using Verizon Cloud, you can quickly deploy your applications through multiple cloud deployment options, things like, like options like public, private, and hybrid, and you can use the same underlying feature sets. In summary, Verizon Cloud offers a cost-effective dev, dev and test production environment in a secure cloud, increasing your agility by allowing you to build new applications with predictable and sustainable performance. I'm going to hand it off now to Todd to cover off on the demonstration of the portal and its capabilities. Todd? Thank you, Stephen. Let me share my screen. Can you see my screen now? Yes. Great. Hi, everyone. My name is Todd Appleton. I'm managing the engineering team here at Dream Factory. And today I'll just be giving you a quick introduction to the portal solution that we built on the Verizon Cloud, and then also showing you the Dream Factory uh, platform itself. Um, we'll look at the dashboard, which is where you go to manage your Dream Factory instances. And then we'll also dig in and have a look at the admin console, which is where you manage everything about a particular instance of Dream Factory, such as your applications, users, roles, and services. So we'll touch on each of those areas um, when we get to that point. So to start out, we built a landing page here at horizon.dreamfactory.com. And this is where developers would initially come to sign up for the uh, sandbox environment. 
So just a little bit of background on what this sandbox is and why we built it. Um, the intent is that a developer will sign up here, create an account, um, then they will create one or more instances of Dream Factory inside this sandbox environment. They'll use that to develop their application. Um, it'll basically be the back end for their app uh, during the development process. Out of the box, you get a database, you get uh, file storage, email services, and then as we'll see shortly, you can add any number of additional services um, on top of those default ones that you always get. Um, once they're happy with their app and are ready to go to production, then we want them to purchase their own uh, cloud resources. And um, you'll see how that's done here when we get to the dashboard. So, you know, basically the first step is they come to this landing page, it's got some background information, uh, both on Dream Factory and Verizon Cloud. There's a simple sign up form here in the lower right. Um, since I'm already signed up, I'll just click this other link. Now this takes me to what we call the dashboard. Um, this is basically what you get when you sign up for an account. Uh, and within the dashboard, I can now manage individual instances of Dream Factory. To create a new one, I can just simply type in the name, click create, and Instantly, I see I've got a new instance called Todd3 down here. You also have the ability to uh, launch instances. So I can click the play button or just click on the name. You can delete them, you can export them, and you can import them. So we provide a lot of flexibility. Um, this lets you even move an entire instance from the sandbox environment over to production if you like. Up at the top here, we've got a call to action banner, and this is where people can learn more about how to move an app to production, get it off the sandbox environment into their own cloud space. If you click learn more, we provide some additional details, um, basically how to go to purchase your own server, and then how to install Dream Factory on that server. We recommend using our Vietnami Dream Factory installers. They're really simple. You know, with just a few clicks, you can set up your own Dream Factory instance on your own uh, server or VM. Got a few links there to various help resources. And of course, if you ever get stuck, you can always contact Dream Factory support directly. If you click the Sign Up Now button on this window, you'll be taken over to the normal purchase page for Verizon Cloud. So if, you know, if you're familiar with Verizon Cloud, that should look very familiar. At that point, you have several options. You can either um, you know, do an immediate purchase via credit card. I believe you can also select uh, to be invoiced uh, for the services that you're interested in. So just to recap, this is the dashboard. This is where you go inside the sandbox environment to manage your individual instances of Dream Factory. In my case, I've got three instances down here, and each one is totally unique. It's got its own set of apps, users, and services, um, and the apps inside each instance have access to the various services um, that are defined. So to give you a better idea of what that really means, let's go look at one of these Click on the first one here. This is what we call the Dream Factory Admin Console. Should come up in a second. Log out. Well, that one's <clears throat> taking a minute to load. Let me jump over here. I've got a different one. Um, so this is the admin console. This is where you go to manage everything about a particular instance. Um, starting out here, I've got <coughs> uh, applications. 
If I want to import an app, I can do that. I can easily just create an app. Um, it's got a, a simple CRUD form here. You need to do this before you can really start your development on your app. This registers your app with the Dream Factory instance and issues you an API key that you can then use to make the REST calls to the Dream Factory API from your app. So creating your app is kind of the first step in, in getting started with development. So it looks like this thing's still trying. Bear with me for a second. The other tab um, here I want to show you is users. Uh, we offer some basic user management. Um, you can create a new user just simply by creating the form here, or sorry, completing the form. Um, if you'd like to then later make any changes, you can just click over to the Manage tab and then click the user you'd like to edit. A user can either be a system administrator or not. If you're a system admin, you have full access to the API. Um, if you're not a system admin, then your access is determined by your role in the system, which we'll talk about shortly. Your app will be using Dream Factory to access services. Typically, this is a database service or file storage service. service. As I mentioned earlier, you get several of these services by default. Um, for one, you get a MySQL database. The API name for that is simply ZB. So if I click on that, I can get a, an idea of, of what that is. Uh, we also offer service definitions for each of these things. So if you have like a custom service, um, you can come in here and edit that and uh, then save those changes. To create a new service, you just click Create. We offer a bunch of different database types. If you pick a SQL database, then there's various flavors you can choose from. Currently, these down here are the ones that we that we offer. The, the basic flow of a call is that your app makes a call to this service using the Dream Factory REST API. Dream Factory then looks up the service in the database to get the config information, which would include normally the connection string and user credentials. All that stored securely inside the Dream Factory database on your instance. Then Dream Factory uses that information to actually make a call out to the service, which could could be on the same box as Dream Factory, or it might not be. It could be on Amazon or wherever you you need it to be. Dream Factory then gets the response back from the service and then replies back to the original calling application. So that just hopefully gives you an idea of sort of the life cycle of a call uh, through Dream Factory. In addition to the SQL services, we also offer a variety of NoSQL options. These are pretty popular as well. Um, these are the ones that we offer right now, uh, Manga being by far the most popular of those options. Now, after I've created a service, um, I can then go to the API docs to explore that service. And this is a really cool feature because it, it's a great way to learn, and it's, it's also kind of a self-documenting API. So if I click DB here, um, now I can click Get, click Try It Out. It returns a list of all the tables on that DB service. It shows the request URL, and I can break that down for you. Here we've got the URL for the Dream Factory instance. Then we've got the normal REST prefix, which is prepended to all calls. 
and then the service name, which was DB. Now, if I'd like to drill down a little further and look at records for a specific table on that DB service, I can do that as well. So I can come down here to get records by filter. Enter a table name I like to do. There's also all kinds of SQL-like filter options. Um, you can set limits, offsets. Um, you can include related tables as well. The URL is pretty much the same, except now we've got the table name appended to the end. And instead of returning a list of tables, it's going to return all the records for that table. Um, based on the filter settings that, that you'd applied. I didn't choose any, so in this case it just returns all three records that exist in that to-do table. Um, you can select between XML and JSON. The default is JSON formatted. Um, one of the powerful features we have is that you can do pre- and post-processing on these API calls using server-side scripting. So I'd like to give you an example of that. Looks like this one finally came back to life, so let me show you there. Think of these as database triggers. Um, on each table you can define one of these things, which is currently JavaScript in our 2.0 product, which is now in beta. We also offer Node and PHP as scripting options. I've put together just a simple script here to give you a feel for what, what type of things you can do. So, so this script runs, as you can see in the name, when you post a record to the to-do table, this is the pre-process script that gets run before those records are actually written to the database. This would give you an opportunity to do any kind of field validation. Um, you could throw an exception here and it would return a 500 error back to the client who could then handle the error as needed. In this case, the script just loops through the incoming request, grabbing the name field out of each record in the request and just building up a comma delimited list of names for the new to-do records that are being created. Um, if, if there was no errors, then it comes down here to this block where it builds up a message and then posts that message to a push notification service um, on Amazon Web Services. This is using SNS. Um, I can easily set that up as a service and then post a message to any topic that I've created over there. Um, so by doing that, you could, you know, send it to an HTTP endpoint, you could send email messages, you could send native iOS and Android push notifications. It really just depends how you have everything set up there in your push service. But one thing to note is the full REST API is available from these server-side scripts. So I could, you know, go out and query a, a different table. Um, you know, do any kind of error checking, business logic, whatever I need to do, and then, you know, unless there's an exception thrown that those things will be written to the database, then the post-process script will be run, and then finally the result is returned back to the client. So, you know, I can't go too far into this. Obviously, there's lots of possibilities, but just wanted to give you an idea of the the possibilities here for server-side scripting. Um, one other thing I'd like to mention about the, the API is that when you create a new service, you get these API docs automatically created. Um, so if I went in and created a database service for MongoDB, it would show up in this list and have exactly the same REST API as the database service, the SQL service that I showed you earlier. And this is really cool because it makes it easy to switch between different databases for your app. If you decided, you know, hey, I don't want this MySQL anymore, I want to use Mongo, it's just a few trivial changes um, in your app, because the REST API is the same, 
the only thing that changes is the service name that, that you're calling from the client. Um, roles is a, an important concept because it dictates who has access to what in your system. If you're not an admin user, then you're going to be assigned a role, and that um, will dictate what services and apps you have access to. If I go to create a new role, I can jump over to this access tab, and this is where I define um, what that role will allow access to. So I could say, for the database service and the to-do table, make it read-only, which means I would only check this get option here. And now anyone, once I save this role, anyone assigned to that role will only have read access to that to-do table. They tried to create a to-do list item, or update or delete one, um, they would get an unauthorized error back at the client. You can also specify whether or not um, the access applies to calls to the API or calls to the API from within a server-side script. If you really wanted it wide open, you would select both of these and then server-side scripts would also have get access to that, that same to -do table. We provide similar access to some of the system tables. Um, obviously, you want to be careful with that, um, but the idea is basically the same. You can just define rules about who has access to what. Each user is assigned a single role, um, so you just need to put some planning in ahead of time and decide um, how you want that to be um, set up. We also offer some basic schema editing. If I select database and to do, it shows you the fields on that particular table. You click on a single field, then you can edit all the details for that, that single field. You can actually import complete uh, schema here from this JSON editor. Um, if you just paste it in here and then click upload, it can create any number of tables. Um, they can even be related to each other, you know, complex relationships, and all that will get created in one API call. So that's an easy way to, you know, get your schema in the system for um, dev and test purposes. Data is a simple data browser. If I click to do here, you'll see those same three items um, that we had seen before. In the file manager, this is where the application files are stored. So when I upload an app or import an app, it will create a directory like you see here under files applications. If I go down one more level, this is the actual source code um, for that to-do list app that we were looking at earlier. If I double click on one of these, I just get a text editor and I, I can do you know, whatever changes I like. Most people actually enable cores on their instance and then work directly from their local machine. That way you don't have to continually upload files to your instance for testing. You can just test everything locally. And then when you're ready to deploy your app, um, you can then upload it to your instance. At that point, it would appear here under Files Applications. The last thing I want to touch on is just the ability to move applications from test to production. We make that really easy with the concept of a package file. All this is is a zip file that has all the application code as well as optionally any uh, schema and services that you'd like to also move with your application. As an example, if I pick that to-do list app, I can include the files. I know I'm going to need the to-do schema, so I'll check that. I don't need to include a service because it only used the DB service, which every instance will have by default. 
Now I can export that. And I can just jump over to this other instance here. This one is actually outside the sandbox system. It is running on the Verizon cloud, but it's it's a standalone instance. So this would be very comparable to what a developer would purchase and set up, you know, independent of our sandbox environment. So now I can go browse, find that exported file. Go back to manage, click the play button. And now I'm running that same app. Didn't have to change any code. I didn't have to manually create any database schema or anything like that. It all just got pulled in as part of that package file. That's kind of the workflow we want people to have is you know, develop in the sandbox. When you're ready to move, um, then you can use either the instance import export or the app package import export to move everything over to your production ready setup. So that's about all I had uh, for today's demo. Hopefully it's just at least giving you an idea of, of some of the possibilities with Dream Factory. We've got lots of resources um, available. You can go to our website um, under developers. You'll find all kinds of information there. And uh, as I said before, if anybody gets stuck or has questions that you can't find answers to, I'm looking to help as well. Our support team is great, so please take advantage of that. So, so with that, um, I'll turn it back over to Stephen. Actually, I'm going to introduce to you, um, I'm going to turn it over to Eric Rubin, who is the co-founder and VP of Business Development here at Dream Factory. So I'm going to give him the ability to show his screen. Thank you, Jill. Thank you all for joining us today. So I'm going to take a step back and talk a little bit about the trends that have been driving um, the need for this type of a portal in the sandbox, um, as well as go into a little bit more depth on the partnership. Let me go into full screen here. Great. So let's you know, let's start start with the trends. I mean, if you think about the way the internet has traditionally been used and how it was designed, much of the infrastructure was designed to deliver uh, web pages to dumb browsers. Um, and what's what's changed and changed dramatically over the last few years is a whole influx of new types of devices, first with phones and tablets and other smart devices, um, wearables, uh, sensors, the whole internet of things. And all of this has taxed the old infrastructure and is driving change for kind of a replumbing uh, to enable these things to connect to now potentially entirely different data sources and potentially a lot more intelligence up at the um, client end. Now, so the need for the, the change in middleware has been driven largely by a whole different set of new clients. Uh, and so what's going on is that the internet is, um, you know, the plumbing, the middleware is undergoing a, a major renovation um, where on the on the front end, you, you have smart devices, uh, often with logic, native logic on tablets and phones. Uh, and then on the back end, you have a whole new set of data sources. Instead of just SQL databases, you have NoSQL databases, you have all different types of cloud storage. Um, and then in the communications layer, you know, what you're finding is a need for a more efficient um, way to communicate between these devices, often that have logic, um, uh, in the middle tier, the servers, um, to take advantage of um, or to be able to optimize low bandwidth networks. The last mile you know, could, could be uh, a much slower ne network than was traditionally planned for, um, as well as occasionally connected uh, applications. 
You know, so that's all driven this need for a new type of middleware that allows devices to communicate with the back ends. Um, the prevailing uh, approach has been through REST. Uh, and so what we're going to talk about today is um, how to automate um, creating this uh, REST API plumbing. Uh, and this, this plumbing is a primary pain point in the enterprise. If, if you look at just mobile alone, you know, mobilizing your enterprise, Gartner estimates that that's anywhere between 50 to 75 percent of the cost and time associated with delivering mobile applications in the enterprise is associated with creating this back-end integration, this, this plumbing that allows you to uh, now use legacy and new uh, data resources. Um, for delivering smart mobile applications. Uh, and so what uh, um, Stephen talked about and what Todd showed you was the ability to now, you know, provide this plumbing, you know, in the form of developer APIs, uh, REST base, you know, on demand in the cloud. So you can connect, you know, clients that could be deployed anywhere, um, as RESTful clients to uh, RESTful endpoints, which are data resources, which also can be deployed anywhere. They could be on-premise, they could be in the same cloud, they could be in a different cloud. Uh, but the concept is um, in that middle tier now, an on-demand way to have a portable set of integration APIs that can exist in the cloud and work with uh, resources regardless of where they're located. And that's the you know, that's the essence of the partnership we've created uh, with Verizon. Um, if you think about it, you know there are there are multiple approaches to you know how you solve the problem of getting a whole new whole new set of APIs to deliver mobile and IoT applications. Um, many uh, enterprises, you know, for lack of better alternatives, have just started and gone ahead and started building their own and, and you know that's fine but there there are potential issues downstream where what you tend to see is uh, you know APIs are built purpose built for an app and a single um, type of data resource and as soon as you start to transverse to um, multiple or other data resources and other applications then you get you know a whole um, myriad of new APIs that are essentially doing the same thing uh, and you have this what we call API spaghetti. Uh, so, the, so the approach um, with the Dream Factory and the, the Verizon portal is in fact to solve the problem by having a portable set of reusable APIs that are written as a general purpose approach so that the same set of APIs can traverse across multiple different types of data resources and work with multiple different types of clients and applications. Um, when you think about the problem of work, uh, portfolio workloads, it's an ideal approach you know, when the problem is I'm not creating one application but I'm creating many. Um, and mobile uh, you know, kind of forces that issue because you know, what you'll find is that Mobile applications tend to be single purpose, kind of unidirectional instead of multifunctional. Um, and therefore, when you break apart a legacy application and start to mobilize it, you'll find you might need 10, 20 mobile applications to do that. You know, so enterprises are now dealing with the problem of how do I create hundreds, maybe thousands of applications versus a handful. Um, so what Todd uh, demonstrated was the um, the Dream Factory sandbox uh, uh, for dev and test inside of a uh, cloud space. It was designed as a frictionless approach, meaning that you simply go and register and start developing, um, uh, and it's free. You know, so that it's a fully stocked sandbox to um, drive cloud-first behavior, meaning start in the cloud and finish in the cloud. Um, Inside of the sandbox is kind of everything a developer needs to build uh, mobile and IoT apps. Uh, it includes our uh, API platform bundled with a full backend stack, a full LAMP stack, and NoSQL. Um, 
and then the concept of the portable API platform is kind of first and foremost, instead of building APIs, we auto-generate APIs uh, that automate backend integration. So that 50, 75 percent um, cost that Gartner associates with projects, we handle with the click of a button. Um, the approach of a, um, you know, the portability of the API, I mean, you could take the same set of APIs and run it on really any backend resource, gives you cross-functional uh, opportunities for maybe using different work, same application, but that put that workload on different um, uh, cloud and on-premise uh, approaches. Um, and of equal importance, you're going to want to move workloads between dev, test, and production without making any changes to the code. Um, and then finally, um, kind of the immediate need that enterprises are, are, are feeling, the pain point is, you know, how do I transform my legacy um, so that I can start developing new workloads for it and um, this REST API platform automatically REST enables or platform enables um, data resources and turns them into a REST endpoint for a developer. Uh, going into a little bit more detail on that and kind of what's inside the platform. Um, you know, it's kind of the first thing is you connect to a data source, so we have a secure backend connection, and again, that data resource could be SQL, NoSQL, cloud storage, could be external uh, REST services, um, and may or may not be in the same cloud. Uh, we, we connect securely to the resource, and we auto-generate a set of RESTful APIs um, that are consistent across data resources, um, and they're you know developer friendly. So it's kind of tuned. Our primary customer for this platform is a modern developer. Um, inside the platform, there's the ability to um, add additional layers of security. So it will, it will if it's a legacy system, it will inherit the schema inherit the security roles uh, and user access, but you can, uh, uh, if it's a new uh, a new resource, you can uh, apply your own set of user management and credential vaulting, um, and if it's legacy, you can add additional level of security if you like. And then finally, um, for boundary cases and creating very customized uh, APIs, there is a scripting engine that allows you to customize our server, really to cover um, uh, nearly any use case. Um, so, you know, main thing transforms any backend resource, uh, legacy or new, into a REST endpoint. Um, and then this architecture allows for kind of, you know, complex or very simple hybrid deploy deployments where you could now put the workload in the cloud. Um, and that's connected to uh, on-premise uh, legacy database somewhere. Uh, we talk about cloud first and uh, cloud last. So, you know, the idea of the portal is to create a very um, smooth progression to start in the cloud for free um, as a dev test environment. Um, and then, you know, uh, and the dev test environment is, is a multi-tenant uh, version of our product in the Verizon Sandbox, uh, and then provide a very smooth progression to allow you to deploy um, these uh, workloads now in uh, production environments in a production cloud by, you know, hitting a button in the Sandbox that allows you to now get a private instance. Um, primary use cases that we've seen with the Dev Portal are you know, dev tests um, and rapid prototyping or uh, proof of concepts. Um, business model for us is the, uh, it's a freemium model. The um, sandboxes um, are free and um, we, uh, uh, we together monetize on deployment of production uh, instances. Um, here's a good example of you know, kind of all of the things you might want to do in this kind of a portal. So this is a, a partner of ours that's in the IoT space. Um, what they do is uh, building systems automation, so connect HVAC uh, to remote controls. 
Um, so they've got kind of a big IoT, Internet of Things da data resource um, in a cloud that they use Dream Factory to REST platform enable, so that now allows them to build applications on top of it um, to control devices, uh, control heating systems, for example, as well as monitor. And these applications were delivered on desktops and um, uh, iPads. Uh, and then additionally, the REST interface is used as a gateway to ingest data um, via RESTful services um, from these building systems and go the other direction and allow you to control these systems via RESTful calls. You know, so it's kind of an all-inclusive example of using the platform to take, uh, a in this case, a legacy data resource, fully REST enable it, make it a REST endpoint, use it for application development, and then you know, take it one step further, um, a gateway between um, in this cloud, a cloud gateway between devices um, uh, and the database. You know, one area where, where we really feel that this is game changing is for DevOps teams because now you have kind of a single cloud approach where dev and test can occur inside of the cloud and um, you can progress all within the same environment to production instances and run all these things simultaneously so that you know with the same set of APIs, the same set of controls for um, elasticity and growing the cloud, um, everything's in the same environment, whether it's dev, test, or production. Um, Todd showed you the, the demo. This is a screenshot of the dashboard, you know, so that from within the dashboard at any moment in time when you're ready to go for a private instance or private cloud, we streamline the process of signing up. Um, and then the next step to that would be to move uh, projects. So we make it very easy to move projects between cloud spaces, package up the workloads, the apps, the schema, all the services, um, the API set, so that you have instant portability into new backends, in this case, uh, new cloud environments. Go, I'm going to turn it over to Stephen for a second to go into a little bit more detail about you know, what happens with that button. So, Jill, if you could unmute Stephen. Great. Thank you, Eric. Can you hear me okay? I can, yes. All right, great. Uh, uh, you guys have kind of hit the nail on the head here, right? This partnership is, uh, is great because we both offer a, a continuum of services from that uh, getting started tef, test dev uh, space all the way through production, right, without having to make any changes to the application or really uh, to the Verizon relationship either. The public cloud is a great place for the, the test dev uh, applications to start. It's a low-cost, on-demand, scalable, and very predictable infrastructure that allows you to come in with your application and build out. You can move to a virtual private cloud from there that accommodates uh, more of an enterprise workload and a virtual private option, uh, which still has the, the uh, economics of the, the public cloud, but offers a little more isolation and configuration flexibility. And that also brings in additional layers of support where necessary. And then you know, to, to finish here, and kind of the top end of this would be a private cloud. And the private cloud is designed for the more mission critical enterprise applications. And it does combine the, the economics of cloud in general with those additional levels of control, isolation, and security that your business requires. Private clouds can be deployed on our prem or yours. And that's that's it, Eric. I, I'm gonna hand it back to you and I'll wrap this up. Great. Thank you, Steven. I think Todd did a great job kind of going through all of the different aspects to the platform. This slide, um, and I believe this slide, this whole deck is available for download if you're interested. 
Um, this kind of covers the main points, you know, so that the the platform itself can be deployed anywhere, inside clouds, in pass, on your desktop, Docker containers, you know, even Raspberry Pi. So it's even um, been deployed on gateways. Um, the main um, aspect is universal data access. So from a consistent set of APIs um, develop, you know, that that's abstracted from the data. You can develop SQL, NoSQL, um, storage applications, hook up external web services, uh, work with new brown uh, uh, greenfield um, data or uh, legacy brownfield uh, data resources, and all of that gets presented under a single pane of glass for the developer. Uh, any clients, so we have SDKs to simplify development for kind of all of the major client platforms. Um, and then, you know, ultimately, when you're getting ready to deploy, you know, it's designed for, you know, our approach has been designed for the enterprise. So, um, you know, it has to be massively scalable on how you can grow this elasticity with the cloud um, and through uh, containerization. Um, needs to be uh, customizable to, to, to meet uh, boundary cases. Um, that needs to be secure, and you know it's an open source uh, project. I mean, it's uh, you know intended to allow you to deploy it where you want to deploy it, and you know no propri proprietary lock-in. Um, the types of workloads that um, we've seen are you know from a greenfield perspective, um, you know use the this all-inclusive sandbox to deliver. HTML5 or uh, native mobile applications, IoT as I've shown, uh, I've shown, you know, for the purposes of dev test in the sandbox, and then you know onboard these workloads to production cloud spaces. You know, very common scenarios would be B2 B2E, so business to uh, employee or business to uh, business scenarios such as partner portals. Um, and then there's kind of the retrofit. Example of you know a legacy integration where I can um, take the Dream Factory platform, layer it on top of an existing data resource. I now have a REST endpoint, and now now I've mobilized it. I can now start you know, churning out mobile applications. Um, that data may or may not exist in the same cloud, um, but the workload should um, exist in that cloud. So you can now start populating workloads in a very elastic environment. That's working with the data resource. Um, in the uh, deck, if you choose to download it, there's a whole series of additional information. Um, uh, here's how you get to the uh, Verizon portal. Just sign up for free. Uh, no dub dub dub. It's a subdomain, Verizon.DreamFactory.com. Um, a very good training video. Should should you have uh, interest in just seeing the high level uh, points. Uh, again, of the platform, a number of case studies off of our site. Very deep presentation. Um, uh, if you're in the IoT space, uh, we put together an hour-long uh, training course on uh, how it's being used in as a gateway in IoT. Um, and uh, Verizon case study uh, um, soon to follow. Uh, so now I will hand it back to Jill for any questions. Um, yeah, Eric, there is a question that came in and I put it in, you can see it in the chat window. Okay. Okay, um, so the question is, is there a time limit or some other restrictions on the free dev portal? Um, the short answer to that is no. Um, you know, it's designed uh, as an unrestricted, fully capable, so kind of all of the capabilities of the product are in the, um, are, are in the sandbox. Um, uh, it's a multi-tenant um, shared um, resource, so the, you know, uh, uh, ultimate uh, production, the expectation is when you get to production that you will probably likely want to uh, move to a private instance. Okay. And another one just came in for you, Eric. Yeah. Uh, 
Um, similar uh, question, can I get a dedicated instance on the free dev portal or do I have to get a private Verizon cloud space to host that? Um, as I mentioned uh, earlier, the, uh, the sandbox itself is a multi-tenant um, deployment. Uh, private instances uh, would be through a Verizon private cloud space. Um, we've made that very easy to start in a multi-tenant environment, click a button to progress to a private instance and move the workloads over. Um, so you can either start that way um, or you can um, get to that point. Okay. Um, next question. Can I integrate with our ent enterprise systems um, specifically enterprise access control. Um, so there's a kind of a few capabilities there that I think are pertinent and it's a great question. Um, the, you know, the, the platform itself allows you to, um, you know, relatively instantly integrate with any external um, REST uh, service, you know, and then it inherits all of the capabilities of the platform around security um, and scale uh, and user management. Um, uh, but additionally, you know, specific to the question, um, there is uh, Active Directory and LDAP support baked into the open source uh, platform. Um, next question is, is everything uh, open source, uh, and if so, how does Dream Factory make money? Um, another great question, near and dear to, to my heart. Um, it's uh, the core technology is open source and always will be, um, so uh, we don't try to monetize on the core Dream Factory now 2.0 platform. Um, we make money in two ways. We have a, um, you know, we sell um, support services around um, using uh, the product both from the development perspective and production support. Um, and we are, you know, very shortly going to announce an enterprise edition, uh, but the enterprise edition surrounds the core. So it's more around how do I manage multiple instances of, um, uh, Dream Factory. How do I govern how they're used um, in a mul you know in a multi-tenant uh, way, um, and you know how do I better integrate it for elastic scaling in my environment? So it's more around the uh, management and operations. The uh, and it surrounds the open source core. It doesn't um, do anything to change the open source core. Um, next question, what if I already have uh, a Verizon Cloud? Um, you know, that's, that's uh, you know, probably a potentially common scenario. Um, I think there's two likely approaches there. You know, one, one approach is you certainly could still use the sandbox in the multi-tenant environment and then move those workloads over to the cloud if you your private cloud if you only want that for production. But at the same point, it's very easy to download the entire um, uh, distribution of our platform. Uh, it's quick and painless, um, and you could put that into the private cloud and do everything there. Um, I think I touched on this. So the question is, what is the difference between open source and commercial and Dream Factory? Just touching on it again, you know, the open source platform, everything that you saw today is you know, protected um, and will always be open source. The Dream Factory Enterprise Edition is the management and reporting console that goes around it and allows you to manage multi-tenant instances 
of the platform. Um, here's a question um, that I'll probably turn over to Verizon and maybe we can add some color to it as well. So kind of it's about how secure is data uh, yeah, Eric, I, I can certainly speak to the, the cloud infrastructure itself, right? We are ISO certified. Uh, we are uh, certainly very uh, aware of compliances in the regulatory environment to ensure that our customers, uh, that our infrastructure and in turn our customers' environment inside that infrastructure are secure. Not only do we provide the BAA, which is a business associates uh, agreement for the facility, which helps customers, customers maintain that first stop on the road to compliance. But we offer uh, plenty of concert, uh, consulting services around uh, governance, risk, and compliance for things such as PCI or HIPAA. And then, uh, Todd, do you want to potentially add some color on kind of different layers of security in Dream Factory? Yeah, um, as I mentioned before, we have uh, our new 2.0 platform is now in beta. Um, so maybe I'll focus on that. I mean, as far as session management and authentication, um, it uses JSON web tokens. Um, so doesn't use browser cookies. Um, 1.9 did use cookies, um, so that's one, that's one of the differences between uh, the two versions. Um, then in uh, 2.0, you've got separation of concerns between admin users and regular users. Um, so I think that's actually a good thing. Um, there are you know different endpoints for logging in an admin user versus a regular user, um, whereas before in 1.9 they were uh, somewhat intertwined using the same API. Um, inside the actual Dream Factory instance, um, any kind of credentials or passwords, things like that, are always um, hashed and en encrypted in, in the Dream Factory database. If I go in and create a service for my database, you know, that's out in the cloud somewhere, I need to enter the connection string and credentials. So, you know, even if somebody got to that information in the database, they wouldn't be able to to make any use of it. Um, so we, we definitely are careful about you know, never exposing those credentials to the client as well. Um, they would only be used in an outgoing call to the applicable service that they're for. Uh, we also offer things like lookup keys. What We call them lookup keys. What it is basically is you can define key value pairs at the user role or system level. So for example, if I had a SQL database that had a bunch of roles already defined or groups defined um, with different access levels, I could then map those to Dream Factory using the lookup key mechanism. In other words, everyone assigned to role A would access the database with this login. Everyone assigned to role B would access the database with some other login. Um, and eventually, we, we want to get to the point where you know we're inheriting that type of role group information from Active Directory. You know things like that. Basically, right now we're just using AD to authenticate uh, users, but eventually we'll get to the point where we can have more advanced capabilities there. All right, thanks, Todd. I think um, that's all we have time for. Um, thanks, Eric, Todd, and Stephen. And as I mentioned earlier, we'll be sending a link out to this recorded presentation, and we'll try to answer any questions we didn't get to today. I'll be leaving the webinar up for a minute so you can download the presentation in the handout section in the GoToWebinar control panel if you haven't done so already. Thanks again, everybody.